night on unceded territory of the Lummi, Nooksack, and Coast Salish peoples who continue to fight to protect their sacred communities, lands, and waters. And I would also like to acknowledge that without immigrants and farmers, everything that you just state would also not be possible. So. This is called Pride. Remember the light wrapped tight in dark branches against the thick gray cold of winter. Hold your hands to the warmth of bones and rotten fruit, feeding the soil, becoming earth. Roots go deeper, our lives entwine below and above the ground. We are the forest, the jungles, the wild grasses making the air breathable. Wind, birds, and tiny creatures scatter the seeds of our resistance, electric and uncontrollable hope. And thank you all for being here for the 14th Annual International Day of Peace Gathering in Bellingham. We are here on the traditional lands of Coast English people who have stewarded life in this region since time immemorial. I'm Mia, and I'm the Executive Director of the Walking Peace and Justice Center. I'm Matteo, I'm a board member of the Walking Peace and Justice Center. And we are very grateful for this opportunity to gather and reflect and learn together, um, to be with like-minded and open-minded and active community members, and to set aside a portion of our day to be together with many people in cities and villages around the world are doing the same. We want to thank our sponsors for International Day of Peace. Their support, along with the work of more than 50 volunteers, made this event possible. And the Walking Peace and Justice Center wants to give special thanks to the two cooks who planned and prepared uh, the next amazing meal. So, Um, for military recruitment purposes. 
So if you are a high school student or parent, um, you need to know that you have the right to prevent your personal information from being shared with the Pentagon. But the burden is on you to take action. Um, at the military, alternative to military service table, which is over right here, the red table pod, um, and on our website, walkingthroughjc.org, we have copies of the forms, um, the forms from some of our local districts here in Whatcom County, along with guidelines on how to go about um, opting out. And you can also catch the Alternatives to Military Service crew at Sea Feast this weekend in Bellingham and at the um, Info Fair at Western Washington University next Monday and Tuesday in Red Square, just up the hill from here. The main work of Alternatives to Military Service is tabling in schools. Every semester, we visit public high schools throughout Whatcom County, set up a table during lunch, and listen to students' questions and thoughts about what their lives will be like after high school. Our group includes several veterans who share not only their experiences with war and with the false promises of military recruiters, but also their insight gleaned from having worn the shoes of a young person considering enlistment when there weren't other options presented to them. We know that the Pentagon relies on the poverty draft to staff its wars, so while we push for Congress to fund diplomacy over weapons and healthcare over incarceration, we also want to show up for the young people in our community who are being aggressively targeted by a culture of militarism that tells them their value is their willingness to obey and to kill. Uh, we want to take a moment right now to recognize one person who has taken this work to heart for many years, building relationships with school counselors, teachers, students, and our AMS veterans and our other volunteers. Um, he's not here tonight because he's having a lovely birthday celebration um, with his partner, but Rowan Peterson has served as our AMS coordinator for the past six years, and this fall he's stepping away from that role. Um, he'll continue to table with AMS, and we're really lucky to have him among us. Um, so let's just thank Rowan for all of his work. We are continuing to build our network of unions, local businesses, educators, and students and scholars who share the idea that young people shouldn't have to sign their life over to the U.S. military in order to learn skills, get an education, and make a living after high school. We are holding a volunteer training for Alternatives to Military Service on October 15th. We invite you to come and join us if you share our passion for this counter recruitment. AMS is our longest running program, but it's not all that we do. Um, over the past 15 years of working for peace and justice in Whatcom County, the center has become a hub for local organizing and activism. Since the election last fall, we've seen the Peace and Justice Center transform as new community groups have formed and existing groups have reignited. In the past year, our Bay Street office here in downtown Bellingham has hosted lobbying visits about Pentagon spending with congressional staffers. It's hosted trainings on legal observing and alternatives to violence, workshops on implicit bias, conversations on gender and race as systems of oppression, sign-making parties opposing the jail expansion and military spending increases. It's also been a staging ground for larger community events, including the Martin Luther King Jr. Human Rights Conference in January, Global Day of Action on Military Spending in April, and the Mother's Day March for Peace, and the Kids and Race Workshop that were both held in May. As an established 15-year-old organization, we're blessed to be able to keep the doors open of the physical office, library, and meeting space. The resources we have in our office are never wasted, and we do what we can to share them with other groups, especially those that are tabling here tonight. Um, our office is available for film screenings and discussion groups. Our tables and chairs get borrowed for rallies and community meals. Our shelves um, store materials for our partner groups. Our library contains over 900 books and dozens of DVDs for self-guided learning. And our e-newsletter shares upcoming meetings, actions, and learning opportunities. We are encouraged to see more people coming into the office to join our work more folks signing up for our newsletter, and more groups seeking ways to partner. So there's, there's nothing easy about these times, but um, we here, people in Whatcom County seeking peace and justice in this world, can navigate these challenges with more ease if we support each other and uplift each other. And if we figure out 
how to show up for the world that we want, which is yet to come, and which we will collectively create. So please enjoy tonight's program. Um, we'll be at the Walking Peace and Justice Center table at the back of the room um, after the program's conclusion. So if you'd like to connect, please um, come and say hello. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Victoria Matei, and I use she, her pronouns, and I have the pleasure of introducing one of the coolest, most badass women I've ever met. Uh, the second we met, it was non-stop talking and laughing. At the end of our conversation, I couldn't help but thank you uh, for coming into my life. I really value your work, your presence, and how humble and modest and easygoing you are. Harsha Walia is an author and activist trained in the law, she is the co-founder of the Migrant Justice Group, No One is Illegal, author of the award-winning book, Undoing Border Imperialism, and project coordinator at the Downtown Eastside Women's Center. For the past two decades, she has been involved in anti-racist, feminist, indigenous solidarity, and anti-capitalist grassroots community organizing. Harsha has made numerous presentations on race, gender, and poverty, the United Nations, and across campuses and media outlets in North America and in Europe. Harsha is the recipient of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives Power of Youth Award, uh, West Center's Best of the City and Activism Award, and been named one of Canada's most brilliant and effective organizers. I want to thank you for being present in our community today. Thank you for the work you've devoted your life and soul to. And thank you for being the powerful woman of color that you are. We are incredibly lucky to have you with us today. And. Um, I just feel so honored to have had the opportunity to get to know you before this event. But before uh, we introduce Harsha, I do have to make an announcement that uh, she has about 10 minutes to sign books afterwards, so please get your books and uh, get to her when, we're, when she's done. Um, but with that said, let's all please welcome Harsha Walida. for being here and sharing an evening together um, and thank you to the organizers for having me it's always a delight to be here um, and I'm especially honored to be here amongst so many familiar faces and I have to say I know there's going to be a, a formal ceremony after this but I really just want to congratulate Rosalinda who is such an amazing force in this community <laughs> Her work, is, her work transcends this community, so you know, I, live, I live in Canada and have followed Rosalinda's work since we met each other organizing against the Minutemen at the border about 10 years ago. And hers and C2C's tireless work on the farms uh, is something that is just something that's been an inspiration. So congratulations and it's so well deserved. And you all are so lucky to have good people amongst you here in this community. Um, it's an honor to be here also on this International Day of Peace. I have to confess I didn't know today was an International Day of Peace <laughs> until I was invited to speak on the International Day of Peace, so maybe I'm not such a good peace activist. Um, or maybe, you know, I've been thinking about it, and I think I'm, I'm somewhat ambivalent about the word peace. Uh, and that's not because I'm opposed to peace, of course, but because we've seen such a co-optation of the framing of peace, right? The most common uh, way that I've come up against peace is actually when I'm about to be arrested and the cops are like, you're not maintaining the peace. So, you know, we've, we've seen the ways in which power has actually asserted uh, peace to actually maintain the status quo. But of course, we're not here for that reason. And it's because we know that peace is not passive and peace is not necessarily polite. And peace should never be perverted to maintain injustice. And what peace is instead is that it's a verb. It's an active practice of peacemaking. It's an ethical orientation that we commit ourselves to every single day to ensure safety and dignity for all people. And one of the people that I want to start off by quoting quite deliberately is Dr. King. And that's because, of course, Dr. King is a hero. And also because I think Dr. King's words are often uh, used in selective narr narrations of what peace means and what peace doesn't mean. And one thing that Dr. King said, quote, uh, is mankind's survival is dependent upon man's ability, you know, man's quote, man's ability to solve the problems of racial injustice, poverty, and war. 
The solution of these problems is in turn dependent upon man squaring his moral progress with his scientific progress and learning the practical art of living in harmony. We will take direct action against injustice despite the failure of governmental and other official agencies to act first. We will not obey unjust laws or submit to unjust practices." End quote. And it is in this spirit that Dr. King is evoking, again, of peacemaking, of defiance as peace, and an ethical orientation towards justice in which I want to talk about peacemaking, particularly at a time where there's such intensified political, social, economic, and spiritual violence that we're facing every single day. So I'm going to assume we're all on the same page that we're in increasingly dangerous and divided times. So I'm not going to sit here and talk about why the world is going to shit, right? We already know <laughs> that's the reality. Uh, that these are incredibly dangerous times. And we know that, you know, the first week after Trump's election, there have been 900, at least 900 report, reported incidents of hate crimes. And these are reported, right? There's even, there's more that are not reported. And yet Trump has refused to denounce any white supremacists that are known and have supported his candidacy. Of course, he's refused to denounce any white supremacist attacks that have taken place in Charlottesville and beyond. And also, this isn't just about white supremacists on the street. Within the first three months of the Trump administration, 41,000 people were arrested by ICE, and this was even before the rescinding of DACA, right? So these are structural formations of white supremacy. So what I want to focus on, instead of talking about Trump, 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 um, is to focus on three, three key issues that I think we need to be contending with. And I recognize that I'm talking not, have, not ever living in the context of the United States, I live in Canada, uh, but of course what happens in the U.S. has ripple effects around the world, right? And it informs our movements and our communities and our political trains in Canada and of course all around the world. Uh, so these are three things that I want to orient us towards. They're not prescriptive. If you disagree, feel free to heckle. It's fine with me. Um, but I, I do want to I do want to talk about them because it also it's it's a cross border issue. It doesn't uh, just stop at the border, right? The border is in some ways well, it's not in some ways is entirely fictitional. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about uh, and that I want to affirm here is that you know going back to a pre-Trump era is not actually a shared vision of peace or justice, right? So that is not the return that any of us are looking for. And so what I mean by that is, you know, the, the times that we're in right now, particularly focusing on white supremacy, that the escalations in white supremacy and state violence that we're witnessing are escalations, absolutely. They're heightened forms of white supremacy, absolutely, but they're not new. The Muslim travel ban that Trump put into place were largely countries that President Obama has been dropping bombs on or has attacked with drones for the past decade. Obama, as we know, has also been the deporter-in-chief, with more deportations happening during the Obama era than previous administrations. Invasion, plunder for resources, imperialist military incursions, and settler colonization on these lands has been integral to the project of Western Empire for centuries. The first white supremacists on this land were colonizers who massacred indigenous peoples. And that genocide continues today. It's really important that we don't continue to talk about colonization as something just happened in the past. This is an ongoing presence that we maintain here on these lands. Colonization is continuing. The lands that we're on are not traditionally unseated. They are still unseated. Indigenous laws and presence and jurisdiction continue to be alive here on these lands. And white supremacy began with the doctrine of discovery here on these lands and around the world. And the doctrine of discovery decreed that any land not inhabited by Christians is open to European settlement, right? So this is the predecessor of colonization as we know it all around the world. And one of the reasons that this is so vital to remember is, of course, to ground ourselves in the recognition of indigenous land and sovereignty, but also because right now, um, and I don't know the degree to which it's true in Bellingham specifically, but of course this is shared struggle in the Pacific Northwest, is there such an emphasis uh, on environmental struggle, right? There's such a, an emphasis on environmental struggle in the Pacific Northwest to protect the lands and protect the waters. And I think it is so vitally crucial in fighting for the land to not mimic the colonial doctrine of discovery by forgetting that we can't protect the land and forget about the people, or continue to invisibilize the people whose land we're on, but to actively center indigenous sovereignty in any fight for indigenous, in any fight for environmental justice. And it's also important. It's also important to remember in 
speaking about peace and speaking about war and militarism, that we cannot speak about saving the environment without recognizing how integral environmental destruction is to war and empire. Again, here and in, in the context of settler colonization, but globally, the primary drive for oil and right now for the Alberta tar sands, for bitumen from the Alberta tar sands in Canada, is the US military. That is the primary driving force for resource extraction. So the solution to environmental degradation is not electric cars or any other form of corporate greenwashing. It's shutting down the military industrial complex that is the primary motivator. So when we're talking about white supremacy, or when I'm talking about white supremacy, and I assume many of us are talking about white supremacy, we're not just talking about fighting white supremacists, those who are uh, avowedly and overtly white supremacists, though that's important too, and I'm not here to condemn anyone who's out there punching Nazis. That's important. Um, but also, also, to understand and disrupt the entire system of white supremacy that's based on colonial invasion, on the enslavement of black peoples, on imperialist crusading, and the everyday exploitation of racialized people. That's what we have to disrupt, and that's what we have to, di and we have to dismantle. And the rise of white supremacy is global. The, the kind of emphasis on, on the rise in white supremacy in the US sometimes leads us to forget that this is on the rise in Europe, in Australia, um, and really all around the world where European politicians in particular have been bartering in populist xenophobia for the past 20 years, very openly, not unlike Donald Trump. And I think there's some key lessons we can learn from the experiences in Europe where they're fighting white, this particular kind of populist white supremacy. The first is that you always confront white supremacists. For a very long time, there's been a debate about whether you confront white supremacists or not, and there's a debate that if you pay attention to them, you're just giving them media attention. That's not, their thing is not whether they get media attention or not. What they want is fertile ground to bring people, to recruit people into white supremacy. And so at every single turn that we have, it is so vital to take a stand against white supremacy. What message are we sending to our communities if we say, well, I'm not sure they're just French, right? White supremacy is not a fringe ideology. It is the dominant ideology of our communities. And if we don't take a stand, we're giving more fertile ground for more people to say that they're white supremacists and to feel okay saying that they're white supremacists. So it's so important that we confront them in a diversity of ways that we do. Um, the second is that we don't let white supremacists and those who are white supremacist apologizers and men rights activists apologizers in the corporate and elite media dictate the terms of debate, right? Right now, the most common debate, of course, is this bullshit debate about free speech, right? That this is somehow about free speech. And, you know, there's just so many layers of bullshit to this bullshit idea, right? <laughs> the first is that it's so ironic that what white supremacists and MRAs are pissed off about is not actually oppression. Right? They're not upset that they've actually faced any kind of oppression. It's that they're being told to shut up because they're being oppressive, right? And that's the most oppressive thing that's ever happened to them. The most oppressive thing that's happened to white supremacists is being told they're oppressive. That's not oppression. Um, and also, there's, a, there's such a hypocrisy to the idea of free, of free speech, right? We've known for the past 50 years that Palestinian academics across campuses, and not just limited to, but particularly Palestinian academics, have been shut down by Zionist pro-Israeli war hawks who shut down any Palestinian academic trying to talk for free speech and for liberation of Palestine, right? They're not afforded free speech. And that's true, of course, not just for Palestinian academics, but for people of color, for people of the who are trying to talk about war and empire uh, and conditions of oppression. So there's not actually an equivalent kind of, uh, of luxury afforded when we're talking about free speech, right? Um, and the last thing, of course, is that it's not free speech, it's hate speech, right? A lot of what is being propagated is active hate speech, and it's a false equivalent, a false equivalent, uh, 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 <laughs> equivalency to suggest that we all have the right to speak. Not all of us are talking about mass murder and incarceration of people and the mass subjugation of people, right? So we don't get to talk about uh, whatever we want when it actively harms other people. And so, you know, what does that, when we're talking about white supremacy in these systemic ways, in these ways that I think uh, force us to think about transformation differently, this isn't just a comment about, you know, uh, about white supremacy that, lead, that presumes that people of color are somehow in the struggle together, right? As people of color, we're facing 
white supremacy, but we also are differently situated within the struggle, right? Those of us who are not indigenous to these lands, or are not black, or have legal status, or are not Muslim, or cisgendered, and more and more and more, have to contend with our own complicities and think through what the project of alliances and solidarity looks like. These are not, the assumption that all people of color will naturally have alliances is a false one, right? And one of the things uh, that Aurora Levine Morales wrote so beautifully, you know, 20 years ago, and there's no better way to put it now, is quote, this tribe called women of color is not an ethnicity. It is one of the inventions of solidarity and alliance, a political necessity that is not the given name of every female with dark skin and a colonized tongue, but rather a choice about how to resist and with whom, end quote, right? And so part of, part of the project of dismantling white supremacy is also to really think through how are we going to actively make peace, right? How are we gonna actively create community with each other across so many layers of, of, of difference? Um, the next thing that I want to talk about that's related to this fight against white supremacy is, of course, what does it mean in the migrant justice movement? And I'm focusing on the immigrant rights movement that I call the migrant justice movement because that's primarily where I'm located, but of course these can be extended into other movements as well. The first is I think we have to stop reinforcing a politics of respectability and model minorities. So much of the immigrant rights movement over the past few decades has focused on appealing to our desirability that we work hard, that we don't have criminal records, that we share American values. And I understand this. At a personal level, I understand this. I myself, my family, has faced detention, we face deportation. And I understand the personal, uh, intrinsic kind of response to say, hey, we're good human beings. Um, but at a, at a movement level, I think we must fundamentally delink ourselves and our bodies and our humanity from this notion of desirability and respectability. We have to challenge the core assumption that only some migrants, i.e. those who are closer to whiteness, not black, educated, able-bodied, English-speaking, without a criminal record, employed, not single mothers, etc., are desirable. Because what does that automatically mean? It means there are some migrants who will continue to be criminalized and continue to be excluded as undesirable. So we absolutely have to reject these framings of ourselves as good migrants that presupposes that there are somehow bad migrants. There are no bad migrants. I believe that no human being is illegal, that is the state's legitimacy that is fundamentally illegal. And so, what does this mean in the current moment? So of course in the current moment we have the Trump administration rescinding the DACA program. And there's of course a call to reinstate DACA. But I think this is precisely the moment to fight for more. This is precisely the moment to say, we actually have to ensure legal status for all undocumented people. We have to ensure that not a single person is left behind. That particularly those who are never eligible for DACA, disproportionately those from the Caribbean and African undocumented youth, need to be involved in struggles for undocumented migrants and for justice. Because black and brown youth in particular who are poor and low income, are criminalized not only through the immigration system as we know, but also through the criminal injustice system, right? So what does a sanctuary city mean in the context of a school to prison pipeline for our young people? It means shit all most of the time. And so we have to be able to say that there is not a single person who is deported and there is not a single person being detained that we will not stand alongside, that every single person deserves our solidarity. So that for me is, is the essence of, of uh, a politic that rejects that some human beings are more worthy than others. The other thing that I think is central um, in our migrant justice work is incorporating, and this is, you know, this is mutual, this is mutual work between movements, but how do we work in stronger ways to, to embrace an anti-imperialist politic, right? One of the strongest refrains of the migrant justice movement has been, we are here because you are there. Right? This isn't an issue about take us in, we're good immigrants. We are here because our lands over there are being devastated. Our resources are being plundered because war and militarism and persecution and economic violence continues to plunder the global south. Right? Our lands and our resources continue to be occupied. And so the focus and the domestication of immigrant rights as a domestic issue that is not connected to foreign policy does a complete disservice to the issue. Migrants are the human face of our foreign policy. Right? We so can't talk about migrants or migrant workers or undocumented people or refugees or all these fake legal categories that the state has created 
in the context of generosity or benevolence. We have to talk about it in the context of justice and solidarity because these are the consequences of our policies, right? And so that is so vital. Um, and you know, what does that what does that mean again in the current context? You know, right now, uh, Trump during his election campaign, Trump, uh, you know, continues to talk about immigrant workers as those who are stealing American jobs, right? On his campaign website, he says, and he weaponizes American workers, and particularly racialized American workers. He says, quote, no group has been more economically harmed by decades of illegal immigration than low-income workers, especially African-American workers. This is precisely the logic of neoliberal austerity, right? To pit communities against each other, to say that we're gonna blame other workers instead of capitalism and bosses and banks, right? And that we're gonna fight each other. And so to commit to an anti-imperialist project that supports immigrants is to support all workers, right? It's not to say we don't want immigrant workers because they're driving down our wages. It's not to say we don't want NAFTA because it's bad for American workers like Trump says. It's to say we don't want NAFTA because it's bad for all workers, especially Mexican workers and peasants, right? rights for all people. And it means that when guest workers, which here is the H-2A worker visa, that when people start to see the exploitation that's inherent to guest worker programs, that we understand that that is the pool of labor that is insourced. The labor that cannot be outsourced is insourced, right? And the way that we combat that drive for, to lower the wage floor is not to say, well, deport them all. They're stealing our jobs. They work for nothing. It's to say, give every single person status and give everyone the right to unionization, right? That's what, that's what that demands. <laughs> the last uh, thing that I, that I want to talk about is, uh, in terms of the last kind of principle, is this false debate that's been raging. Is it, I don't know if it's raging in Bellingham, it's raging in the social media sphere. That's all I know about the US is social media spheres. Um, but this raging debate between race and class, right? And this raging debate about identity politics or pro-socialist politics and which one's better and which one's worse. Is this happening? Yes, right? Um, and so to me, this is troubling. And I'm, I'm sure it is for you all too. And that's because the ways that these debates have been constructed is to assume that race and class are identities. And race and class are not identities, right? We, we, uh, we embody these, these as identities, but race and class are fundamentally structures. And the dominant political economy that we live in is that of racial capitalism. And this was theorized by leading black, smart, leading black Marxist Cedric Robinson. And you know, one of the things that Cedric Robinson theorized is that how the first proletarians were inherently and foundationally constructed as racial subjects, right? That capitalism was not possible, was not possible without creating racial subjects who were the victims of dispossession, colonialism, and enslavement. And so I want to stress on people and, and really emphasize that when people are talking about racism and white supremacy, when I'm talking about racism and white supremacy, it is not a reductive comment about identity. It is accounting foundationally for the ways in which racism is constructed through class and productive relationships of capitalism. Race does not exist outside of capitalism. And one of the things that Stuart Hall talks about, um, another leading black Marxist, is quote, racial structures cannot be understood outside the framework of specific sets of economic relationships. Race relations are directly linked with economic processes. Race is the modality in which class is lived, the medium through which class relations are experienced, and the form in which it is appropriated and fought through, end quote. So why do I bring this up now is because there seems to be so much hand-wringing about what to do in the post-Trump era about the supposedly white working class, right? What to do about the white working class. And to me, the entire premise of and construction of the white working class completely misses the mark. To somehow say that the white working class is somehow going to be separated from a multiracial working class from a working class that is led by brown and black struggle, that is led by women of color, that is led by queer and trans leadership, and that now somehow we're gonna carve out the white working class and educate people on racism, separate from a struggle for multiracial working class liberation, to me is a false premise. It's no 
not possible, it reinforces white supremacy. Right? A multiracial working class movement dedicated to liberation. So this fixation on the white working class to me is deeply problematic. Um, and connected to that, I would also say that our analysis of the working class must expand, right? Because part of the reason we're so fixated on the white working class is, I would argue, because of white supremacy, but also because we're stuck in a particular vision of what it means to labor, right? The reality is, is that you know capitalism is one that has not only created the conditions for the expropriation and exploitation of labor, but it's also limited how we characterize labor. And so we typically define workers as those that are producing within the industrial, financial, service, or technological economies. But women of color who predominate in undervalued, deeply undervalued sectors, particularly domestic work, right? The work of single mothering, um, the work of tending to the land that indigenous women do, that peasant women are engaged in every single day, is not even classified as labor. The labor of women, overwhelmingly women of labor, is actually stigmatized as uncontributing, unproductive labor, right? That is a deeply patriarchal capitalist idea, because this is largely the labor that actually allows life to sustain itself, right? <laughs> emotional work, single mothering, is the hardest fucking work on the planet. Right? And, you know, Raj Patel, who is one of the world's leading economists in The Value of Nothing, he did an economic analysis of women's unpaid work. And he found that women's unpaid work is estimated at 11 to 15 trillion dollars annually, which is more than half of the world's entire economic input, but it's completely unpaid. Right? And so, you know, why do I, why do I say this? Why do I talk about um, thinking about work in a different way, uh, particularly, again, in this moment? It's because Hillary Trump is not the fucking feminist antidote to Donald Trump, right? It's because what we need, that's, that's not a vision. I'm, I'm sorry, I swear, I don't know. I'm offending people. But, you know, to me... Now with Hillary Trump. Oh, yeah. Hillary Trump. of, you know, a deeper, a real kind of feminism lies in being clear, again, not that Hillary Clinton's our savior, but that it's being clear that the violence of patriarchal rape culture is the same that impacts women's bodies, that violence is the same kind of capitalist extraction of land that is taken from the earth. It's understanding that women's liberation is firmly rooted in ending the exploitation of women's labor at home and outside the home. And that feminism offers a transformative potential by valuing relational work, care work, and emotional labor. And so I want to conclude with, you know, so I've talked about all of these different things. And the reason that I talk about them is because it's really understandably easy to be disheartened in these times, right, of, of Trump and beyond. But I think this is precisely the time where it is so much as possible. So much as possible in terms of bold and transformative politics one that weaves in a range of critiques and articulations that understands that the violence of the system is not an aberration. The system is meant to kill us. It is not broken, right? It is meant to kill us. It will kill us unless we destroy it first. Warfare. These are all related systems of exploitation and control. And we must fight all of these systems together. We must orient ourselves towards freedom because our lives and the future of the planet depends on it. And what I want to end, it, end with is a, a quote by Howard Zinn, the great Howard Zinn. And he said, to be hopeful in bad times is not just to be foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we only see the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act, and at least the 
possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents, and to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory. Thank you. change the conversation. We're so fortunate in Bellingham to have a Whatcom Peace and Justice Center to support the work of all of these groups. But that work needs everyone here. I see a lot of European American faces out there and we have benefited from the institutional racism and the militarism and the capitalism as consumed. So I want to ask for your help tonight. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is reach into your program and take out this envelope and hold it in the air. Inside this envelope, you will find many opportunities to change the conversation, to support the Watkins Peace and Justice Center. It can only change. We can win this struggle. But it takes everyone in this room. So tonight, you can put some cash in this envelope. You can write a check. You can go to the back where Neil will be and she will accept your credit card. But I'm going to ask you to do something that I do. I have gone to the Watkins Peace and Justice Center and had them arrange with my bank to do an automatic transfer every month. It's only $20 a month for me. You can do more, you can do less. It's not even noticeable. You don't see the money, but it adds up. It accumulates, and it supports the work of the Walker Peace and Justice Center. So if you're interested in doing that, you can check if you'd like to contribute monthly, Put your phone and your email, and someone from the Peace Center will call you and help you set this up. If we don't step up on an ongoing basis, we cannot change this conversation. It's on us. It's on each one of us to do this. This is the only fundraiser that the Peace and Justice Center has all year. But they need money all year. They need to keep that office open to support the work of all of these groups. I hope you'll join me. I hope this is an important time. It's so important. It's so critical that we cannot not give. So please, dig deep, listen to your heart, and give more than you think you can. Thank you. Here. If you don't have a pen, if you need a pen, or you can put your envelopes in, these two folks here are going to be collecting those for you. Thank you.
Oh, you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs>